You're listening to the Patient Advocacy Now podcast, presented by Greater National Advocates. It's just gut-wrenching sometimes. Like, if it's sad and they're crying, I might cry. (laughs) Amazing how many doctors do not even want to treat somebody who has Medicaid. Medical system is about making money. And I said, so are you hiring more nurses or you're just telling each nurse to work harder? So, Eileen Karina, thank you so much for being on the Patient Advocacy Now podcast. I'm really excited to kind of go over so much with you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. You have a really interesting personal journey that brought you into this world. Would you mind kind of sharing that and going over that so that we kind of get a sense of where you're coming from? Sure. Um, Many years ago, over 30 years ago now, I had a son who had surgery. And after his surgery, he was bleeding for a week. And during that week, uh, it was a tonsillectomy. I brought him to uh, four, five different doctors. I don't even remember now. I've said it so many times, though. Uh, and we, we um, each doctor in the emergency room said, don't worry, he's fine. Even the surgeon said, don't worry, he's fine. And eight days later, he died from blood loss and um, infection. His body was full of infection. So that was very devastating, obviously. He was my only child at the time. How old was but he? What, he was almost three. He wow. was almost three. And what was really concerning me is not just that so many people left me as friends and and, um, we were kind of straggling because people couldn't believe it and and the trusted healthcare system was um, something people wanted to trust. But nobody was asking me what I could have done different and what could have been done different. Nobody talked to me about it. So then I had a very severely premature child. I had a healthy birth after that and then a very severely premature child who was born in just 23 weeks instead of the normal 40 weeks. Um, And thank goodness for the wonderful medical team. He did fine. He's doing fine. He's 30 years old, and and he's a perfectly healthy young man now, as my other son is also. So I like to say I saw the worst of health care, but I also saw the best of health care. And throughout that time, I was still very frustrated that um, the bad things were happening. I knew bad things were happening, and nobody was asking me what I could have done different or asking other people what they could have done different because I started talking about my son and his story and people were sharing their experiences. And there were a lot of bad experiences out there. Um, in, in 1999, I went to my first medical conference, a patient safety conference, and that's the first time I heard healthcare professionals not only talk about patient safety, medical errors, but also their loss of family members because of medical errors and um, poor planning. I mean, there are so many different reasons why their own family members were not safe in the healthcare system. And when I kept going to conferences, the more conferences and the more studies I read, the more I realized that healthcare professionals were talking to each other and completely leaving the public out of how to stay safe in the healthcare system. So I started bringing that information to the public and and talking about what I was learning at these conferences. And then I was invited to be part of these organizations, these medical organizations, the, the National Patient Safety Foundation, the Joint Commission. I was on those boards for many years mm-hmm. and um, was accepted as a voice of, um, of patient safety uh, from the patient's perspective. And, and the family's perspective. Yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. I know it was a while ago, but it's, it's, the fact that you talk about it so much must make it still feel so recent. I don't know about recent, but it makes it very real. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, it costs me my job, it costs me my marriage. It's, it's um, a very, it's a strong passion that um, he was my son then, he's my son now. And I don't want the, the, um, I don't want to just move on. I never wanted to just move on. It was not an option. I had to protect my other children. I had to let people know that this was something, you know, it was something that was happening that the public wasn't aware of, and we needed to be part of it. The public needs to be part of it. I think you mentioned something that's really interesting that we neglect to talk about so much in the healthcare space. When tragedy like this hits, you lost your job right? It cost you your marriage. And you mentioned earlier, a lot of friendships also went away. 
what why does that happen what what is you know what what does that look like well that's a news topic <laughs> thank you um i think it happens be, in in my case because it wasn't a choice that i was going to make it was a choice that was made for me that i was going to continue talking about him and the more people avoided talking about my son the more i got passionate about the need to talk about him um but my job, the first my job was very secure and, and supported my work in patient advocacy and and working at getting legislation passed. It was early on we got legislation passed and um, I traveled to conferences. I took a lot of time off from work, but then I wanted to move on. I was invited to work at a health system to do some research under a grant and I left my um, my job, a civil service job that was a very good job to do this kind of work. And when I took this grant that I worked for two years on patient safety, it didn't occur to me that I would have to find a job after two years. And I didn't know how to run a nonprofit. I didn't know how to um, you know, run a business. I didn't know how to do any of this. So I was left um, straggling through, the, the, through life with trying to figure out what my next steps would be because it wasn't an option to walk away from patient safety and education. It's become part of your identity for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not something that you plan. It's just something no, that no. it just happens. And it was working that people would listen, but, um, but not make the changes. We're just, we're, we're grassroots. Did you ever find out what could have been done differently for your son? Oh, it was. It became pretty obvious that if somebody would have put him back into surgery, he probably could have been, um, and could have been saved. Um, but the best thing that happened to me in the 25 years that I'm doing this was when a mother called and said, "My child's going for a tonsillectomy. What should I watch out for? What do I need to know?" And that to me meant I I reached the audience I want to reach. They're wow. they're being proactive, and that was very important for me to to have somebody say. I hear you, and I want to learn from that. Um, of course, it, you know, I, I never heard back from them, but it was important that it made a difference. It could have made a difference. So there was many things that could have been done different, and those are the things that we hear over and over again for other people, that if, I, if there was somebody like me that would have listened to me back then, mm -hmm. he might be alive. But it's impossible to measure positive outcomes, and that's been our problem for all these years is when something goes right how do you measure that and prove that it went right yeah. so if somebody goes and gets a correct diagnosis you can't really measure that because that's the way it's supposed to be but if somebody gets the wrong diagnosis that's what's being measured wow and what we, a great point that. that's yeah. the uphill battle of of showing the efficacy of patient advocacy is that when things go right no one notices you don't you don't get a curtain call you know when someone's healthy <laughs> right so um we have on our website um a, a, a page called one is a number and that comes from a, a hospital executive that said to me about funding if you want funding then you have to prove that the work that you're doing is working and i said well if, if it's, you know, he said by the numbers, and I said, well, if it was your child that survives or dies, is one a number? And we start, I started a website, on the website, a page called One is a Number with the statistics of an easy access to statistics. So people could look it up and see how many medication errors, how many people die from infection, and, and we have easy access to all that research. Yeah, and it's such an emerging part of the healthcare system, even doing something like, I mean, you couldn't do a double blind, but like doing something where you have a controlled study of maybe a small sample, pop, small population sample of people who have advocates over 10 years versus people who don't. I mean, it's just so new and, and the types of advocates that are out there are diverse. So it's, I mean, it's almost impossible right now to do something like that. It is. We Trust me, we've thought about it many times yeah. and we try to figure out how... We can do, but we're a volunteer organization, so we don't have, you know, we don't even have an executive director. We don't have a, you know, people to do this kind of research. 
Um, we have a lot of ideas and a lot of written material. And, and over the years, we've done, we do three programs a month right now, all related to educating the public. So our audience is the people who want to be patient advocates or caregivers for their family. We start at the very grassroots level. Mm -hmm. uh, who are thinking about becoming patient advocates. We support their journey through. And of course, people who are longtime patient advocates, because then we want to match them up with the people who want to understand what a patient advocate does. Well, I think that's a, that's a good segue to understanding what you know you define a patient advocate does, because it does have different definitions from different, depending on who you ask. If someone has a nursing background, it has a different you know, application than someone who might have more experience in the billing space. So for you, and maybe your specific organization, Pulse, right, what is a patient advocate? What do they do? Our focus is very specific on patient safety, on safe care, policy standards when you go into the healthcare system. So we look at things like um, misdiagnosis or medication safety and hand washing, things that are very related to safe care. Uh, and, and we also focus on the family. We, we call our advocacy family-centered patient advocacy and, and not telling a person calls, uh, and I take the calls, but if a person calls, I'm not going to tell them, here's what you need to do. We encourage their family and friends to become their support person. And then we can tell them, here's what you can do for the patient. The patient needs to just get better and, and, and be concerned about themselves and and may not hear things and may feel vulnerable. So we want them to just take care of themselves and build a support system around them, whether it's our volunteers or, or a team we can build for them, or they just give us some names of people to contact for them, or they send people in their support team to us that we can work with to help them. And, and it could be a series of things. It could be the insurance, if, if that's what it is, but our focus is on safe care, and that could mean you need to make sure your insurance is paying for your, your care, or you may not go for it. Right. So there's so many different little avenues, even within the context of safety, and you're a volunteer organization. I just want to get a little bit grounded in what this looks like. So do people find your organization and they call you, and a lot of the assistance is done over the phone or virtually? Do people actually go into the hospital sometimes? Well, my very favorite thing for before COVID was to go into the hospital and go into go with people to the doctor's office. And I call that my training because that's where the problems happen. And, you know, the, the standards and policies and rules are all made in the boardroom, but errors happen at the bedside. Yeah. So I could be at a medical conference or talking to someone in healthcare and says, all our staff wash their hands and they just, they do what they're told to do. It's like, Take, and I've said many times to people, take off your tie and go sit at the bedside, shift change, and go see what really happens in your hospital. Because they, well, everybody wants to say that their hospital's doing, their staff are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I'm not blaming staff. There's so many different reasons. They may not even realize that they're not doing it. And that's why we, the patient, and our families need to speak up about things like infection prevention and control and and diagnostic and safe medication use. But the people who work in healthcare, the leadership, don't see what happens at the bedside. So for many years, we did have our volunteers and myself going into the hospital. And I would, I would get on a plane in a heartbeat and travel around the country to be with somebody wow. at, through, through their hip surgery. Um, we worked a lot with the transgender community and, and watched the bias that happens. Or, or, or a Hispanic young 17-year-old Hispanic mother who just had a baby and, and watch how she's treated in the hospital. And if you don't see it, it's really hard to believe that this is happening. Would you mind days. telling me more about that? Because, I mean, it's, I, 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 I don't have those firsthand experiences. How, what do those biases look like? Well, uh, oh, there's so many stories. Um, we, That's we what I love a... to hear because I think it puts a human face on this issue. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and I, I get my, my privilege that I'm a white middle-class woman, and I, I, that's, I learned that also, that I could talk to a nurse very differently than a 17-year-old um, or, or somebody who's very um, elderly or a family member who's stressed because their loved one has dementia. But the, the, um, the, there was actually, I was with somebody who's transgender in a hospital where the whole floor was people who were transgender. and The, the whole floor? 
the, the whole floor of people getting transgender surgery, the transition oh, okay. surgery. Okay, okay. It was a the floor in the surgical. hospital. Yeah, they were, they were patients. They were the patients. Gotcha. And I watched these the volunteers walk past the room with the magazines and newspapers. And I, I said, could you come in? And she ran away from me. And I said to the nurse, what was that about? And she said, oh, they're afraid of the patients. And I said, what? How? I, I didn't even understand that. And she said, yeah, and they're all the um, the wives of the board members, so we can't say anything about it. And and I just, that's acceptable. I, I, to this day, I tell that story because wow. it's just so unbelievable that a hospital, it wasn't the state, it wasn't, it wasn't local, um, but I couldn't believe that that happened. And, of course, the patients saw this, and that was upsetting to the patients to think that this was allowed. Um, people who are, are um, dis- have disabilities, they are definitely... Um, there's a bias against people with disabilities. We uh, taught a course to leadership in a hospital on working with people who have disabilities. And the leadership, one of the women in the leadership said, I can't believe they, you know, we're doing this. They take up so much time. We just don't have the time to take care of them. And, and then the nurse manager who was with me said, oh, God, what are you talking about? Don't say that. Don't say that. And I said, please say it. Let's let's get it out. This yeah. is the elephant. We need to talk about that. If they're taking up so much time, then something needs to be done differently. And another another in another hospital, um, somebody said to me, in a room full of people, we make sure our nurses spend extra time with people who are in wheelchairs who have disabilities. We make sure they spend extra time with them. And I said, so are you hiring more nurses, or you're just telling each nurse to work harder? What do you mean you're telling they're, they're taking care of them? They're obviously stressed out if you're not giving them more support. So it, it's really, um, you know, we did this called the Healthcare Quality Project. It was a one-year project that lasted over 10 years, and I still love doing this. <laughs> yeah. um, we worked with people with HIV, and we talked about them having one of the questions that came up is about their um, uh, having their healthcare proxy. And we do something called patient activation through community conversations. And they get to check off what they want to talk about anonymously, and four people checked off their their um, the healthcare proxy. Nobody wanted to talk about it. thirteen people in the room, and I said, "Look, four people want to talk about. It. Let's talk about it." And the concern was, how do we get choose somebody if we don't want our family to know that we're HIV positive? And just for people who who might not know, a healthcare proxy is someone who looks over your medical care if you are incapable of of doing it yourself. Exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. So they, they, they talk for you if you can't speak for yourself. Right. They, so they have to under, they have to know your background and your information. Um, and I didn't know the answer to that. So I left it to them to discuss. It became a good conversation. But then I called the, um, the groups I, it, it, community groups I knew that were support groups for people with HIV and said, look, could you guys talk about this? Because it seems to be a pretty heavy topic. And I left it with the support groups to continue the conversation. So, um, you know, those are some of the some of the stories we have, you know, of course, on the website, lots of stories and lots of experiences, people who are day laborers and, and how they're treated because they don't speak the language. Um, you know, it could be any one of us because we feel very vulnerable when we go into the hospital health care system. Um, the, the black community, um, you know, are, are accused of being drug seekers, a woman who was the ran the health system that she went into the emergency room looking for pain medication. It was her health system, a black woman. And she tells a story about how she was accused of being a drug seeker. Wow. Because she was wearing a sweatshirt and jeans and dressed down and they didn't recognize her. So there's no but sensitivity she... training? There's no, there's no like equity kind of approach to stuff like that? Well, now it's, it's, it's pretty popular to have this kind of training, but nobody believes, oh, it's I think, very that new. it's that. Yeah. Yeah. It is new. And, and I think people want to say, well, I it's not me it's not me but you know we have to admit that we have a little bias in us if we're not you know if we're not going to admit it then we're not going to be open to this conversation and i when i started this i really i, I was naive i don't know about bias but i was very naive uh-huh. and i said some stupid things but i went to my colleagues and said is this a stupid thing to say and they i trusted that they would correct me um, because I didn't understand, I wanted to learn and wanted to. Well, understand. that's a testament to your own humility. I think that's you know one thing that could, the healthcare system could probably use a little bit more of is that sense of humility and that sense of willingness to to look at what's wrong, for sure. Yeah, and being an advocate for people who are 
or support person for people who are vulnerable like that. Um, somebody who's homeless, I was with somebody who was homeless, and then the social worker asked me to step out of the room to talk to her. And they said, no, <laughs> no, we need to talk here. And if he wants me to step out and talk to you, it's one thing, but I'm not going to talk without him here. I'm not going to talk about him outside the room. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I understood that she wanted to discuss his case and didn't want to embarrass him, but he, he knows what's happening. There, he's not dumb. He's not, you know, he, he was homeless. It doesn't make him a bad person or or, or lower IQ level. He just was homeless, and, and they were very disrespectful for that without even realizing. I think she was trying to be respectful in that case. Right, but it was misguided, right? I hear it you. was really was misguided. And I pull, sometimes I pull nurses aside and explain to them. Yeah. It's very helpful for people who are um, transitioning. It was, I think it's very, very helpful to be, um, when they didn't understand, what do we call this person? Is this, a, you know, a man or a woman? What do we, and I was able to pull people aside and explain, do some education. Um, so, and, and, you know, the young mother who was, um, who, who had a baby and was, she was a homeless young mother. Um, they didn't know how to treat her and they didn't know what to say. So I was able to be a buffer and I don't mind that. It's when mm -hmm. they come out and say things that are not very nice Yeah. And, and, and don't recognize. So I'd like to think that there is training in this. We do training. Our, our advocate training is, covers this a lot because we do have the videos and we do have the real stories. Um, and experiences, so we do this kind of training. What kind of training is involved, since you brought it up, in becoming a patient support person or an advocate? Well, the, to become board certified patient advocate, and I can't speak for everyone, uh, but there is a test. Uh, it's a few hour test, and it's a lot of studying. It could be very stressful to take this test, people. And then you get um, the designation of BCPA, board certified. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do um, our pulse training, our family advocate training. We give certificates that people have taken our training, and it's on safety, and it's on um, it, it's not it's not quizzes like medical information, Medicare. We don't need to know that. It, most of ours is on empathy, on communication, and on patient safety, and reducing falls, infections, communication. We focus on on the day to day activity between a, a person, a, a support person, and a patient. And the healthcare team, making sure that's working. What are the some of the kind of typical egregious errors you you've seen over the last twenty five years bedside when it comes to safety? Wow, that's a great question because I still am amazed when I was sitting with a patient and her knee was I'll say Pat, uh, and I was sitting with her and and I heard the nurse in, at the next bed saying Pat Pat wake up I got to give you medication. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm witnessing this myself. Are you? And I used the last name, and she was at the wrong patient. She was about to give the, the wrong patient a medication. So that's something you hear about, but you don't always witness. That, right. that happened twice, very similar. Another time, um, they don't, they're don't. supposed to always check the name and arm, ba you know, mm -hmm. name and birthday. Some people get annoyed at that, but it's because they could take the wrong patient. And I've seen right. people take the wrong patient. I had a patient who was going in for a hernia surgery. And the wife came running to me and she said, he wants to do the surgery on the left side and it's the right side. I don't even know now. I don't remember. So I had to go talk to the doctor because I was just getting there right before the surgery and he was going to do the surgery on the wrong side. So wow. these, th these are things you hear about and they may not be deadly, but I did have a woman who was quadriplegic. The agency that she was involved with asked me to visit her. A few times I visited her. She said that they're really... Um, they're treating her terribly. She was a little tough, rough around the edges, and everybody knew that. But she said they're going to drop me. The way they were lifting her was inappropriate. It was terrible. And um, and I went to visit her maybe four times, and then I got a phone call that she was dropped, and she died. She hit her head, and she died. Oh, my gosh. And she would not let me report the way they were treating her to the senior leadership. I couldn't go without her permission. Um and you never expect that to happen. Usually I cry when I tell that story because the guilt that I have that I, she told me how dangerous it was there for her. And she even had an aide coming in. Her aide was her friend, um, not getting paid to be with her because she was in the hospital. She was terrified for her safety. And sure enough, I got the phone call late at night. That she that she died with after hitting her head. I've and I've heard this many times where people do you believe it? Maybe is it, is it a sense of embarrassment, or they don't want to get people in trouble? 
Because there is this thing where people don't want to speak up. What do you think the reasoning behind that is? Well, because if you're in the hospital and you're almost naked and you're counting on that person to get you a bedpan yeah. or your right medication, you don't want to speak up. You don't want to piss and them off, right? You don't want to piss them off, right? right? You want your food. You want to make sure that your, your lunch tray is on time and you're, you're very vulnerable. Yeah. So that's why it's really important for the family and friends. And we call it being respectful but assertive. Sure. Because we give out, you know, a, a big joke that we, we do is um, if they haven't washed their hands, it's not a joke, it's serious, but um, it's the standard response is when you ask somebody, could you please wash your hands before touching my mother or my sister? Um, they'll say, I did already. And could they, of course, they're going to say, I did already. And we'll say, would you do it again for Twizzler? And we, I carry Twizzlers or, or Snickers or chocolates or You're so something. brilliant. Oh, my God. What a great <laughs> response. What a and, great and, response. You just, you just diffused all the tension. You, exactly. gave a, you gave a nurse who's overworked a little bit of a sugary treat. And I mean, that's so brilliant. We need more of that. Oh, my God. That, I I leave, always say, this conversation, absolutely. just for that one tip alone, is that's genius. I'm going to use I it got, with my I, kids. <laughs> yeah, I got my, my, my cups that say, um, that say, thank you for washing your hands. Take a Twizzler as a... <laughs> You can help yourself to a Twizzler as a thank you. So, yeah, we do, um, um, you know, we make sure that there's always candy in the room for mm -hmm. the nurses because then they come in the room. A lot of people bring the candy or cookies to the nurse's station. But we want wrapped candies in the patient's room so you get this trail of nurses and aides. Oh, well, we another great nurse. tip. Another great tip. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, you know this, oh, we have a lot of tips like that. But you want to, you know, uh, the, after one ner what, one um, person, after the first time I went with a patient, she washed, she got mad at me because I, I have wipes and I wipe down the patient's armrests or whatever they're going to touch. Um, the next time we went there, we saw her, it was a patient was getting some testing. Um, she washed everything down. She was, I remember you. And she had this really bad attitude. And um, so she washed everything down. And I thanked her. And as we left, I left a, a $1 lottery ticket on her keyboard. And her whole body, her, her eyes welled up, her whole body changed. But even the patient said, oh, my God, what a change in her. You could just tell the appreciation after she was really nasty to me. You know, yeah. I, I washed everything down. But I wanted to thank her because she did her job and she maybe even went above and beyond. And I appreciated her. So a little $1 lottery ticket went a very long way. And I carry them with me all the time. I think what's so inspiring about your approach is there are problems in the healthcare system. You're seeing the problems. You're being assertive, but you're doing it with such grace and such kindness in a way where people feel like you can be on their side and on the patient's side. And we need more of that, you know, where, where you don't feel like people are pointing fingers. You feel like, look, I want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people talk about, you know, visiting hours, and I, and I remind people that visiting hours are very often for people who are annoying, that they, ha they want to kick you out. <laughs> but I've never been asked to leave. I've been given a, a cot to sleep on when visiting hours are over because I am there to make their job easier, to make sure things go well. If I do see a mistake, I bring it to their attention and thank them for fixing it. I do not want to, to upset or aggravate people who who are in this job for making a living like many people. Um, I don't believe people are, are purposely mean or sloppy, but I do believe that we as a, as a society entering the healthcare system need to be better prepared. That's the Take Charge campaign that we have going. It's five steps for safer healthcare. It is what the public needs to do before they get go into the healthcare system. At something like get the healthcare proxy we just talked about. Mm -hmm. When you go into surgery or in the emergency room, they're going to ask you, who is your healthcare proxy? And that's not the time to figure it out or make the decision. Yeah. We need to do that ahead of time. Many times I've been asked to be someone's healthcare proxy because they were unprepared. And I, I, I don't want to do it. I wait till, you know, I had the conversation before and after that I'm done after the surgery. But, you know, your own list of medications. People go into the doctor and say, I forgot what medications I'm on. That's not okay. That's not, right. that's not the way we, we make the best use of our time and their time, or even your symptoms. You know, to say my back is killing me is not going to help a doctor figure out your back problem. Yeah. We want people to be prepared to become a patient if they're going to enter the healthcare system, just like when you get on an airplane 
you prepare before the airplane takes off. You know all the safety features. You don't buckle up when the car is about to crash. You buckle up before just in case. And we want people to be prepared and, and more, um, have more, more ready to be patients when they go in the hospital. And so is Pulse, which is the organization you founded, right? Pulse? Yes. So yes. is Pulse kind of in that spirit promoting healthcare literacy as it's one of its primary goals, or is it about getting actual patient support, physical bodies, you know, on the line or in the hospital, or is it a mixture of both? Well, I don't like the term literacy, I'll be honest with you. Okay. Health literacy is putting the responsibility on the patient okay. and the family. Communication is what we, we focus on. So um, my job earlier was in the post office. For 20 years, I worked in the post office, and I've never found a doctor that knows the difference between certified mail and registered mail. And that doesn't make them postal illiterate, right? That's mm -hmm. not postal literacy. It was my job to explain to them. So communication between patient and providers is what we work on. And we don't, um, a lot of advocates have HIPAA forms signed and, and uh, um, want information to the patient's background and their information. We don't do that. We don't do anything without the patient. So the communication that might happen, if I'm sitting with a patient in the doctor's office and I see the patient is not getting it, not understanding it, and the doctor explains it three times, then you want to make sure that go give me somebody else who's going to explain it. I'm not going to try to explain it. If, if, if it's their procedure and what right. they're going to do, I might say, do you have a video? Do you have some literature we could read? But if my patient's not getting it, I'm not going to try to explain it to them. Because so a, it's lot not my the, a lot of the goal there is to empower the patient to make the right decisions for themselves, it sounds like. Right. And it could be that the advocate is helping the family members sure. could be helping because I've been there with family members. I'll go for their diagnosis with the whole family. Um, but when, when you see the families looking like, I don't know what they're talking about, then it's up to the advocate or the, the support person to speak up and say, look, they're not getting it. Um, is there somebody else who might have more time mm -hmm. to explain this? I'm good. I have a phone over here. I'm going to go call a doctor because the patient just told me today, I don't even remember what the doctor said. You know, so I'm going to, she gave me the number, permission to call the doctor and see if I could design it a little better. And then the doctor could call the patient back because I, I'm not going to be the one to explain it. I, I might understand it so I can have a conversation, but I can't start explaining to patients. I'm not a medical person and I shouldn't use that right. as, um, as an advocate. I shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. What, when do you feel like is the right time to get an advocate involved? Is it only when uh, you get sick or is it, do you kind of wish people got started with this kind of journey a little bit earlier? Well, the Take Charge campaign, which is what we're really focusing on now, is to choose somebody now. Um, during COVID, I called my mother and said, let's go through your medications on Zoom. We mm -hmm. did it on Zoom. So people could be partnering up now, early on. Like a healthcare proxy, we want people to choose early yeah. and have their advocate and not just have an advocate, but be an advocate. Who could you support if you know somebody's not feeling well? Um, or, or it might go into the hospital or go to the doctor. Can you do more than just drive? Could you go into the doctor's office? We also do something called remote advocacy now, where I could be right now listening to a patient in the hospital on my phone mm -hmm. and leave the phone line open so I could be listening in when the nurse comes in. Re recently, when the nurse came in and said to the patient, um, well, she gave the patient at 3 o'clock in the morning her pain medication, when the patient woke up in the morning, she said, I didn't get my pain medication. I said, yes, you did. She was there at 3 o'clock in the morning. And then during discharge, because this was during COVID, um, the the uh, nurse was saying, or the, I don't know if it was a nurse or doctor, was saying, we're going to send you home with pain medication. And the patient said, okay. And I said through the phone, is it an opioid? Because she does not want to take opioids. She wants to stick with Tylenol, she told me before surgery. And the doctor said, yeah, it would be an opioid. So now, you know, Opioids is something I believe is a is a media term or a medical term. It's not a patient term. It's not something used for patients. It's something that we hear about after the addiction and after the problems. So we have to say an opioid, if this is what you're giving a patient, you're giving them an opioid. Yeah. And and, and not and not just to have try clarity. To them just to have some clarity there. Right. Right. Because you're talking about people who are addicted to opioids. Well, uh, 
What's an opioid? Right. I didn't even know well, I was I'm taking, taking them. I thought I was taking pain medication. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Oxycodone. I'm not taking opioids. I'm taking oxycodone. <laughs> right. 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 I mean, that was, I actually experienced that myself that right. early on when this all started. I started saying, what, which I'd never taken opioids. I took Vicodin though. So, you know, we don't well, know. Since you've been part of it for so long, can you tell me a little bit about why there was a board created for certification for patient advocates and what the goal is in kind of giving people this BCPA kind of identification? Well, I remember when it was started many years ago, um, I, I was asked to be involved. I, uh, it wasn't something that I believed in at the time that I wanted to put my time into, but it does make it, um, it does make it structured if somebody d wants to use somebody who's board certified, that's a choice. It means that they pass a test. It's not that different than using a doctor who is, you know, some are really good and some aren't really good. So does it make somebody really good? No, it keeps standards. You set standards. But if they do something inappropriate, what is the process to, what is the... the like disciplinary, you, what you, right. What's the right, right. I don't think that's ready yet. And... um so you, we know not to use that person if you're not happy with that person. It becomes a reputation um, what, thing more than anything. Yeah. Right, right. So it's it's not a bad thing. I'm I'm, I'm glad it's out there. I'm board certified myself. I'm glad I am. It keeps me with um, with the the people who are and want to keep up their certification. And um, it is a certain amount. Of, a certain standards are set for people who are. But it really doesn't make somebody better than someone else. Because, again, we believe family members could be the best yeah. advocate for, for a patient. Um, so, But if you wanted to start a business, that might be someday a requirement to be board certified. I don't know. Right. But it, it's, it's an emerging um, field. So, yeah, for sure. It is. It is. Well, it is. I, I, if, you, if you feel like you have a calling to be an advocate for people outside of your immediate circle, outside of your friends or family... What do you think makes someone a good advocate versus someone who it might not be the right field for them to get into? Well, it depends what kind of advocate they want to be. If they've done it with friends and family, and usually that's what I find happens is, is I was my, you know, somebody might say I was my mother's advocate and then she died and I learned all this, this, and I was really good at it. Now what do I do with this? Um, most of the people, that's who I hear from. Uh, I encourage them to let people know that they're willing to go to the doctor with others. I encourage them to start without any kind of pay, build up their reputation yeah. or a very minimal amount of pay. Right. Um, not go, not drive patients. I don't let anybody in the car because it's a whole insurance piece, you know, whole, and be very careful not to give advice, not to um, push medical advice, set their own standards, have a written policy for themselves, treat themselves as a business so they can start their reputation and, and never, never stray from it. Uh, if I accidentally give somebody advice, I am so aware of it because we just don't do that. Right. We do share, uh, our policy is to share what has worked for you. I, this is what's worked for me. The Twizzlers work for me. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. You could choose, if you want to use it, use it, but I'm not telling you to do it. Right. Um, so we want to be really careful of how we have conversations about, um, you know, health care. And, and our focus is not on people's health. That's very important also. You can, um, if you don't eat right, you don't exercise, you, you know, you take drugs, it's your business. I'm not going to tell you to do that. I'm going to encourage you to tell your doctor and make sure that you share that information with your doctor. But I'm not going to be the one to tell you how to diet, how to eat right, how to, you know, how much exercise. That's, that's between you and your, your medical team. Mm -hmm. So that's also a very big piece of what we do. We don't give medical advice. Some nurses and doctors may do that who are patient advocates. Right. You want to be careful. Right. Well, Eileen, thank you so much for, for sharing this kind of infinite well of wisdom. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. We could talk for days. Where is uh, a good place people can go to learn more about your, your program and, and more about this whole cause? Well, PulseCenterForPatientSafety.org is our website. It's, it's a long one, but it's PulseCenterForPatientSafety.org. And if they go to programs, they can see the three programs a month, or I think it's under events, where are all three of our programs. Um, uh, we have all our programs are related to um, advocates and caregivers and patients come together and learn together. So we don't turn anyone away. 
two a month are do have um, CEs for board certified patient advocates. One is a discussion group, open discussion group for topics people bring. One is a small group discussion. They come, we give them a question of the of the month, and people break go into small breakouts. And then ACES Advocate Collaborative Educational Series is a speaker and then case studies where again people um, interact at the end of that one. So there's three different types. We also have some speakers throughout the month and events, and they're all in the evening and they're all on Zoom and they're all free. Fantastic. God bless you for the work you're doing. Please keep it up. Thank you so much for being a light in this in this kind of very thick and dark space that it gets to be for so many people. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it.